Before going all out with the second part of this series, I thought we needed to expand a bit more on what we already did with some optimizations and funny experiments. I highly suggest you to watch the part 1 first, if you didn't yet, since I'm going to give for granted all the stuff I explained there. Moreover, if you're among the ones that downloaded the filter from Gumroad, you may want to download it again, since I have updated it with the new stuff you're about to see in this video. First, let's see how to make the code we did last time a bit more digestible by the GPU. If you remember, the Laplacian filter gives a weight of minus 1 to every pixel it evaluates but the middle one. Currently, we are checking for each pixel if we are in that position, so we can execute a slightly different code. Oh my god, that's so bad. We can apply a little logic trick to remove the condition altogether, at the price of an extra sample. I think it's worth the trade. By removing the if statement, along with the exceptional case, we are actually running a filter that gives us the negative sum of all the kernel pixels. So, to really obtain the same result as before, we can just add back the middle pixel value after we are done with the loop, with its weight increased by 1 to compensate for the fact we subtracted it before. Let's trim down few more instructions by pre-calculating the incremented middle weight from the start, which means that we now have to decrement it just for the normalization at the end. Actually, let's also rewrite these two divisions as two multiplications by the reciprocal of the dividend. That's cheaper. Now it's time to raise the quality bar for our lines. The fact our kernel is square shaped means that we are drawing with an hypothetical brush that has a square tip. A circular brush would give us a much better result, but how do we obtain it? The kernel will always be a square sadly, so the one thing we can do is to avoid including in the calculation all the points that lie outside of an imaginary circle inscribed in the kernel square. This is a quite straightforward idea, but raises a fair amount of problems once we start thinking about how to implement it. First, we don't know in advance how many pixels will be inside the circle given an arbitrary kernel size. We can work around this by initially setting the center weight to 0 and increasing it by 1 for each evaluated pixel. And how do we decide if we want to evaluate a pixel then? Well, for each coordinate we need to check if we are inside a circle of radius half kernel size. To do that, we work with the circle equation. Actually, in our case, is an inequality. If the pixel distance from the center is greater than the circle radius, we don't want to evaluate it. Let's pre-compute the squared radius value, and let's add an if statement that does that check. The continue command will tell the GPU to skip the rest of the code for that iteration and go straight to the next one. That's it, look how more consistent the line shape is in every spot now. Wait a moment, this means that we can potentially change the function to have a brush of any shape we want. We even might be able to recreate something like Photoshop's brush. Ok, uh, let's see what we can do. I'd say we need to figure out how to parameterize an ellipse that can be rotated. Hmm, first step to obtain an ellipse is to multiply one of the two coordinates by a number. In this way we obtain an ellipse that is always axis aligned. We now need to figure out how we can rotate it around. Luckily the thing is not that complex, we just need to rotate x and y before putting them in the inequality. I'll be very concise in the explanation of the 2D rotation, as I think I already covered it in this other video, along with a bunch of other things. The counterintuitive thing we do when we rotate vectors is that we don't actually do that. We rotate the world around them instead, and then we measure that vector in the new coordinate system. So, the first thing we have to do is to calculate the axis of the rotated space. Since they are both normalized vectors and orthogonal to each other, the thing is quite simple. We firstly design an angle of rotation alpha, and we use it to compute the components of the rotated x-axis by doing the angle cosine and sine. Then, for the rotated axis y, we can just rotate this x by 90 degrees counterclockwise by swapping the components and negating the sign. As final step, we finally project the vector we want to rotate on this new axis to discover which are its components in this new rotated space. If we now use these new components in the ellipse inequality, we can freely rotate it. Notice how the ellipse rotates clockwise as a consequence of rotating the space in the opposite direction. Let's translate everything to code now.
Cool, now we have three parameters to play with to define our lines. Let's see how they work. I'd say that's much better now. The only thing left for you to do now is to choose if you want to subscribe, join the Discord server or become a Patreon like these lovely guys did. Wisest people do all three at the same time. As usual, if you want to download this code ready to use, you can follow the link in the description. I'll see you in the next video.